I'm pumped to get started. We're back from our little break and really excited to have a good friend of mine, Mike Redboard, on the session today. A bunch of really cool knowledge he's going to share with us. Also got Dave Blake, as always, on the session, CEO of Client Success. So I'll give a bunch more detail on everybody. But um, Dave, Mike, how's it going? You guys hear us okay? Doing great. Okay. Yeah. Excited to be back on it with everybody. And thrilled to join today. You guys are up to some great stuff here. Happy to contribute. Yeah, it's going to be good. Mike, how's, uh, how's life being quarantined in downtown Boston right now? Well, the inside of my four walls kind of probably feel like most people's. Uh, but, uh, you know, some days I think I was born for this. Uh, today right. Today's a good day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm in the same boat. So I, uh, me and Dave were having a discussion the other day about uh, when do we figure out, you know, going back into the office. And I was just like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow walk that. I'm, uh, I'm feeling good with where we're at right now. So nice. Well, good. So just so everybody sees, um, as you see here, we're back at it with webinar series. So hope everybody had a good chance to go back, get caught up on some of the previous sessions. Um, if you don't know where those are, you go back to clientsuccess.com slash webinars. All the previous sessions are uploaded there. The, the recordings, the slides, if you want to go back and view, um, go back and see them there. As soon as we get finished up with Mike today, we'll post this session. And yeah, so that's that. And Dave, I think you want to share a couple things. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Excited to have everybody back. We hope you're hanging in there. Um, we're stoked about the, the session today, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I uh, just want to say thank you for joining us. We know there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of, uh, things competing for your time, uh, especially your customers, which are most important. And we're grateful you'd carve out uh, an hour every Tuesday and Thursday to, to join us on these awesome sessions. I've loved them. I'm really excited about today. I um, want to remind everybody just about our, our um, encouragement to help one hire one. That, that is uh, aimed at our friends and colleagues who have been unfortunately impacted by this uh, time. I had one locally who just got a job the other day, which I was, we were all so excited about. And so there are jobs out there, Usually. there are openings out there. Um, sometimes people just need, need our help. And so any chance you can to help somebody, please do. If you're in a position to hire somebody, please do. And we'll all get through this together. Uh, this is such a great community. Um, second thing is I'm stoked to have Mike with us. Mike is, uh, I've, I've, I watched him from afar for a long time. Some great leadership, great thought leadership. Fortunately, I was uh, able to have Mark Stoddard join our company who, knew, who used to work with Mike. And so I got that introduction. I, f I'm, I feel honored to know him. Uh, just great experience in the space. Uh, really excited about his topic today, and Mark will, will give more details. I just want to give one food for thought. Right now, more than ever, uh, is a validation and a celebration for our space, customer success space as a whole. Um, now more than ever, companies need to double down on their customers um, and uh, take care of them, and that's what we're all doing on the front line. So thank you for, for all the good work you do. The other thing is to realize is now more than ever is the importance of, of revenue um, and CS teams owning revenue. We're seeing a, a, a trend where um, sometimes those teams that make it through this period of time are those that, that own a number, not afraid to own a number. And so you'll see a lot of focus on revenue from uh, client success as a company and the emphasis on that uh, for, for, for many teams and, and being able to care for that revenue. And I'm excited about Mark. He's bringing some awesome, awesome insights today about how to get ahead of renewals, how to properly manage them. And, um, and so really stoked to have uh, Mike with us. Um, so with that, I thank you all. We're here as a company to help anytime we can. So let us know how we can help and um, looking forward to, to hearing from you, Mike. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it, Dave's not going to toot his own horn, but if you haven't seen it yet, either go to our blog, clientsuccess.com slash blog, or go to Dave's LinkedIn and read his open letter to SaaS CEOs. Really good read, really good, you know, insight. If you're kind of you know, just kind of a really good overview of kind of the current state of play in customer success and SaaS in general. So little plug for that. I'll put the link to it here in a second in the chat pane, if you want to go read it, but um Hey, we're, we're calling out the CEOs, but we're also calling out the, the CS leaders in there. So anyway, uh, yeah, nobody's off the, nobody's off the hook. That's right. 
Thanks, guys. Exactly. So, cool. Well, little primer on client success for those of you that are new to the sessions, new to client success, um, want to just learn a little bit more about us before we jump into things. Um, if you've never come across or seen a demonstration of client success to give you some updates, we are a customer success growth platform. And so really what we do is we're going to help with all things related to customer success, whether that's helping with your onboarding, your product adoption, your renewals, which obviously we're going to talk a lot about today, um, growth, anything your customer success team needs to really provide a great customer experience. Um, we're a leader on G2. If you don't know about G2, it's customer feedback forum. So real customers rate and review different products. I think pretty much everybody in SaaS knows, knows all about G2, good friends of ours. And, you know, we we're frequently rated as a leader in customer success. And so we'd love to show you. We've been releasing some really cool stuff recently, especially since our dev team's been in lockdown. They've just been heads down releasing some really cool stuff. So if you want to have a look, hit us up. We're at clientsuccess.com. Get us on Twitter at client success. Um, yeah, we just love, love to show you more about what's going on, but let's, um, let's get on with today. So I'm pumped to spend some time with Mike and all of you today. He has a really, he has a ton of really cool experience that he can share. Um, Mike and I first met, it's been a while now. We go back to the early days of HubSpot. You probably don't even remember the first time we met Mike, but we met, I'd been at HubSpot for like a month. And if, uh, if you guys are familiar, like, like in and out Burger, you know how they have like a secret menu of stuff that like you can get, but it's not really on the menu. Early days of HubSpot, we had the same thing. And first time we met, you were, you were teaching me about a secret product we had called, called the Angel Small product. You remember this one? <laughs> yeah, it was the animal style of uh, HubSpot way back then. I mean, that was a baby company, you know, we uh, yeah, were just man. getting going. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, I mean, for, from there, um, I forget what role you were in at that point. I think you were what we would now call a CSM. I think it, at the time we called you an inbound marketing consultant or an IMC, something along those lines. Yeah. But from there you went on to run, you know, all parts of kind of customer experience at HubSpot. There was a point in time where you ran global support then moved from there to run global customer success and then went from there to run kind of a new business, the, 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 the service hub business. So I think what you've got is a really unique view that, you know, a lot of people don't have and that you've, you've really run both, you know, if you call it like the proactive and the reactive side of the customer experience. So I think there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can share. Um, and especially on today's topic around how do you build, you know, a renewal ops engine in your business. And I'm really thrilled to, to have you share with everybody. And so I'm going to go on, I'm going to stop share and give it over to you. And while you are bringing up your screen, um, just so everybody knows, like usual, I'm going to man the chat pane and kind of play color commentary as we're going through things with Mike. Um, you've probably got um, maybe let's call it like 30 or so minutes of kind of content, but like keep the questions coming in the chat. I'll monitor those and we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll do a longer Q and a toward the end, but, um, let's get into it. All righty. So I think everybody can uh, hear me and see my slides. How are we doing, Mark? Give me a thumbs up. For good. Good. Perfect. Looks good. for Alrighty. me. Cool guys. So, so let's roll. Uh, Mark took you through a little bit of my background. Uh, previously I ran customer success at HubSpot. And one of the big things that I did there is develop the renewals organization, really get a hold of how that revenue was flowing through the business and ultimately organize it and you know, really use it to promote a better customer experience around the renewal, as well as better revenue outcomes. So uh, thanks for coming today. I hope to just share some of the things we learned along the way. Uh, if you're interested in me, you can send me an email. I'm old school like that. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd love to connect with you guys and talk more about this in the future. So let's talk about renewals. And uh, I think that you know, Mark and, and me kind of came up with this title of renewal management for dummies. And it wasn't meant to be pejorative or hurt anybody's feelings. I think the, the reality though, is that you know, how many people out there actually feel like they're running a smooth renewal operation and are surfing the wave of renewals like this person on the left? Or are you a little bit more like the rest of us, like Job over there on the right, just kind of throwing stuff into the ocean and just every wave of renewals crashing over you and um, you know, soaking you through? And 
in my experience, when we're really honest with ourselves, you know, the vast majority of us uh, running customer success and working with customers or running SaaS businesses are really on the right side. And even if you have some elements of smoothness, there are components of your renewal operation that you still wish you could optimize, whether it's your revenue outcomes in terms of upsell or your total contract value in terms of contract length or, you know, just the customer experience and self-service around it. So I think most of us are really on the right-hand side here. And that's why we kind of called today Renewal Management for Dummies, because if we're truly honest uh, with ourselves, and I think we can be nowadays, especially, we're all kind of dummies at this. So taking a humble um, kind of reductionist perspective in, in today's conversation. All right, so the thesis here, really most of us are not riding a smooth way to renewals to enter our gold. And that's half the challenge is, is actually getting the right outcomes for your business. The other challenge is that if you're somebody who is managing renewals, thinking about renewals or involved in renewals at your business, you're surrounded by a lot of chatter and you hear stuff like this. Uh, you hear your CRO um, say, can you just kind of get me another five points of upsell ne next quarter, you know, that'd be great. And you know, perhaps your reaction uh, to continue the arrested development theme is a little like Michael here. And you're like, look, there's always money in the banana stand. There's always money in renewals. It's sort of what it feels like your CRO is saying. And you're just maybe like, how, how am I gonna do that? Great ask, five more points of upsell on NRR. How the heck am I gonna do that uh, next quarter? Half those renewals are already done. You might hear from your CEO, hey, I was talking to some of our customers and they really don't like our renewals experience. Can you go ahead and fix that? And perhaps your reaction is like Lucille here, where you're sort of like, oh, okay, let me just like, you know, try to calm myself. Or perhaps you hear from your CFO, hey, uh, it'd be really nice if we had some more longer term contracts because, you know, the economy is kind of in a downturn. So can you just go get some more multi-year contracts next month? And, you know, again, it's just like kind of this non sequitur where you're like, how am I supposed to do that, right? Um, or lastly, you might hear from your CSMs and the people actually managing the renewals. You know, I thought everything was great and then they ran into some integration issues and they canceled at the last minute and you feel like this or you're just like, you know, this is one of the worst things that can happen when a renewal was shaping up well and falls apart at the last minute. So, Cecilia you know, is giving you mad stuff. props. She says your gift game is fire, man. So, what, you, we could probably Thank end you. the presentation right there because you, you, yeah, that's you, it. you I'm nailed actually the gift gonna game. Go now. Let's call it a day. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad you like that because that's actually about it for gifts. I ran out of gift fire energy at this point. Um, but you know, I think if, if you're managing renewals or you're involved in it, you hear this kind of stuff, you sometimes feel that way. And you also feel like you're not really you know, riding this wave successfully. And I think that renewals can be a very fraught kind of topic for a lot of us who run it because everybody wants a piece of it and we ourselves don't feel like we're doing a great job at it. So what I want to do today is help us all take ownership of renewal management. And you know, I'm a real advocate of extreme ownership. Like, it's all your fault, right? And think about all of the pieces that go into it and how you can execute better for your customers, for yourself, for your business. It doesn't need to be complicated. It also doesn't need to be complete, right? You don't need to roll out the perfect gold-plated version of renewal management on your first version or your second version. It's a work in progress like everything else, like ourselves. And it doesn't need to be cemented. It does need to move over time and jive with your business. So let's take ownership. Let's not worry about doing it perfectly. Let's worry about doing it well. All right, so here are the five things I wanna take us through in the next few minutes. Um, it's kind of just my approach to renewal management version 0.1. So for those of you who make software, we're not even at like a 1.0 yet. This is just really getting up and running. But I think a lot of these principles, like the five here on the screen, are incredibly useful no matter what phase of sophistication you're at in your renewal management. The way I see it, step one is really about just defining your approach. Step two is getting your data organized to enable that approach. Step three is leveraging the data to forecast your pipeline and gain visibility. Step four is operationalizing your management and your execution of those renewals. And if you can do that, then you can do the last thing, which is actually to drive better renewal outcomes and better experiences. So I'm gonna break each one of these off one by one, spend about, I don't know, three to five minutes on each one. Uh, so if you're only interested in number four, you can go make a sandwich, grab a lunch, and uh, come back in about 12 minutes. All right. So let's talk about defining your approach here. I think this is, um, perhaps the thing that is most challenging for most of us to do, which is to take a step back, kind of get on the whiteboard, get out of Excel, get out of CRM, get out of tools, and just think and plan what your approach ought to be to renewal management. So one of the core thoughts that I've, I've encountered uh, when building out renewal management at HubSpot and also advising other companies doing the same is that 
a lot of times you approach renewal management like your other customer success playbooks or even your sales playbooks. And you start to say, okay, here's like the point in time and I'm gonna work forward from there. And a lot of CS playbooks like onboarding or mediation playbook or you know, a professional service, they work forward from the date that something starts and then they last a certain amount of time. Renewal management is actually kind of the opposite. So when you start to enter a renewals mindset and think about how you're gonna manage your renewals, you gotta think a little backwards. You gotta flip the world on its head a bit. Because think about it, your renewal playbook needs to work backwards from the renewal date. So you can see the difference here. On the left side, we're taking day zero when you know, onboarding starts and we're counting up. On the right side, we're taking day zero at the end, at the far right, and we're counting down to day negative 90. And in the middle is your renewal time, right? So it's a little bit of a backwards approach in a way uh, where you need to work backwards. Most CS stuff and onboarding works forwards, renewals works backwards. That's thing number one I want you guys to keep in mind as we just kind of enter the renewal mindset and start to define our approach. The whole reason for that is that the renewal hinges on the date that the contract ends. Whether it's monthly, annual, or even three or five year contracts, every contract has an end date. And that's really the key date for when the renewal is closed. And you wanna start counting backwards. So here I have a 90 day window, which might be appropriate if you have like annual contracts. Uh, you start to work that renewal 90 days beforehand. But really we wanna think backwards and start with day zero and say, okay, that's when the rule closed. What do we need to do before that to ensure success with our approach for our process here? Just as an example of things that you'd want to put on your renewal timeline. Perhaps you have a, a notice period where your customers need to give you notice in order to cancel. There's a three day or a 15 day notice period. That's actually the last day a customer can cancel. Before that, maybe you send out an automated renewal email. Right, saying, hey, this is what you signed up for, this is what will happen if you do nothing, or these are the options that you have. Perhaps your billing system does it automatically and you don't even know it. Uh, this is a really good opportunity to dig into what the actual customer experience is uh, pre-renewal. Perhaps you have a process or a playbook where today or in the future, your person who owns your renewals, which I'll talk about just as a CSM for the sake of simplicity, uh, perhaps you have a moment where your CSM reaches out, say it's 60 days beforehand. And then maybe, you know, way, way before that, uh, you start to forecast and talk about those renewals, you know, three months in advance. If it's, May, if it's May right now, you look forward, right? May, June, July, August. And today you're talking about renewals on August 17th. So this is the type of approach that tends to work pretty well in my experience, where you hinge from the renewal close date, you work backwards and you really map the customer experience and the key touch points that you need to both run a good business and run a good experience inside this renewal time, inside this renewal window. This has a couple of really interesting implications, right? So one is that it works back, backwards, right? Like we talked about before. Two is that there's various kind of pockets in here that you can use to create better outcomes. So if you're looking at your renewals, 90 days before they close, you have 90 days to produce better outcomes in terms of revenue or upsell or customer experience, or perhaps even save those that are canceling, right? If you look at the example I have here, if this is what your kind of process map looked like, you'd actually have kind of this like 30 day period in the middle from like 60 days to 30 days uh, where the CSM can actually get in there and do some good work. If you start to find out, ooh, this customer might not, might not be as healthy as I thought, the time to action that it's sort of in this kind of zone, right? Like you started to update your forecast, you have your first outreach, and probably you wanna try to make some hay and make stuff better before all the automation starts and before you really get down to the wire. You wanna have the customer value buttoned up before you start to get right up against um, kind of the third rail of the renewal closing on the far right there. So I think defining your approach, and it's gonna be different for every business, defining your approach is really, really key. Get on the whiteboard, count backwards from your renewal date, and if you don't know where to start, if you have annual contracts, 90 days are the right thing to, I think to look at. If you have longer term contracts, maybe six months. If you deal with a lot of legal and procurement, it might be somewhere in the four to six month range. Just start by drawing that timeline and kind of mapping the events that happen on there today. And then think about what it, would, what it should look like. What ought your customer experience to look like? What do you need in terms of time, in terms of the leverage period to make a change, to remediate, to save, to upsell, in order to have successful outcomes from your renewal? That's really step one here, folks, is defining your approach, working backwards, and mapping the journey. Looks like we've got a mix of like, we got probably about half the folks that are commenting, like they've got something similar on those lines. And then there's a bunch of people that are like, dude, we're, we're early stage startup. It's either in my head or not even you know, thinking through it. Got yeah. some folks that are using different systems like Salesforce or whatnot to manage that process. Um, 
Vanessa's asking if there's any good tools out there. Yeah, we'll chat more about that for sure. Yeah, so for those folks who don't have anything, honestly, you should not be thinking more complicatedly with, with more complexity in your customer experience in your process than this. Like this took me a whole slide, you know, like this, this actually took like some work to put together. Really don't complicate it. Start with very simple. Remember, we're not trying to be complete. We're not trying to be complicated. We're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to get this stuff done in a way that gives our business the visibility we need and the time we need to make uh, revenue outcomes the way we want and gives us the time and pacing to make the customer experience really good. We don't wanna jam customers up on the far right side here with like one day left saying, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. That's not enough time for them to think and digest what you're up to. So start we got, we got one question here that's from Jessica says, they start engaging, their CSM starts engaging, sorry, their CSM team starts engaging six months out. Yeah. Like, do you think that's too far ahead? You've got 90 days here. Like, what are some of the implications where you know, six months might be right. Like maybe unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So if you work with, um, you know, either longer term contracts, you know, longer than a year, you have maybe three year contracts or something, or you work with industries that have sophisticated procurement processes, government, education, stuff like that. Um, I think renew longer than 90 days is kind of a must. And I really like a six month approach. I think the, the thing you want to think about when you, you know, have a longer renewal window is you don't, you don't want to tell the customer like, you know, three months into their contract, let's talk about the renewal. That's just, that's just not going to make any sense. Right. Sure. So if you have a six month renewal window, you know, I think it might be appropriate at the six month point to kind of circle up internally, get your data together, start formulating a plan, check your health. And as you do your next QBR, you know, as a CSM, you have in mind the renewal coming up, but perhaps you don't actually mention it and force the conversation on it, but you're kind of thinking and planning towards it. Um, and then you actually start the conversation when it's appropriate. So I think you need to exercise a little bit of judgment there. Otherwise you end up in a world where your customers feel you are not focused on delivering the value. You're focused on delivering yourself revenue. Oh, great. Cool. So the next thing I want to talk about here is organizing your data. And this is something that is, I would argue, hard. <laughs> uh, for a $1 million ARR SaaS business or a $100 million or a $1 billion SaaS business, it actually like, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the data that is germane to us in the subscription business industry is just hard. Um, and it's about as hard for a smaller SaaS business as it is for a bigger one. And you don't have the resources sometimes to you know, build everything that you need in terms of getting your data organized and understanding it. So what I want to propose in this section, kind of like I did in the last one, is a very reductionist, very simple approach to organizing your data in the renewal process. I basically have five pieces of data that I think are your foundation. And then there's a bunch of stuff uh, that we'll talk about in a moment that you can use to augment and do an even better job. So when talking about the data needed, like, what do I need in the spreadsheet? Or what do I need in my system? What do I need, what do I need on my clipboard? <laughs> Whatever you want to manage it. Uh, what do I need for a successful renewal? I think we want to think of success on two different axes. One is great buying experiences for your customers. Renewals need to be good buying experiences, just like buying in the first place needed to be a good buying experience. If I buy your product and I have a delightful experience with a salesperson, a good onboarding, then during the renewal, I feel like you're just ringing me out for more money that's not going to set me up well for my next renewal or for a good review on a place like G2 Crowd or whatever review sites you use or good advocacy. So we need to have the customer experience in mind, but we also need to balance that with having good revenue outcomes. The renewal is a really key moment to resell, recommit, and to right-size value to spend. So if someone's getting a ton of value out of your product, hopefully you have a pricing model that enables you to capture some more of that value and revenue. And it's kind of a good handshake. Say, look, customer, you're getting great value we're gonna charge more and it's a good bargain, right? So we want to think about this in terms of a bit of a seesaw and balancing good buying experiences with good revenue outcomes. And here's the stuff that I think you actually need. I mentioned five pieces of data before that I think you're gonna need in order to run a successful renewals play. One is who's renewing, like what is the account name, right? Two is who owns it. And you might have in, in your organizational structure, you might have renewals owned by salespeople or account managers or CSMs or perhaps a specialized renewals team. For the sake of this presentation, folks, I'm just using CSM. As a, you know, think about your CSMs as doing renewals. Uh, so you need to know who owns it. So you know, hey, Mike, this account with this name is coming up for renewal. You also need to know when because you need to tell Mike when the account is coming up on what renewal date when the contract ends. Then you need to know how much is it for? Is it a small account or a big account? And roughly how likely is the renewal? Is this thing, 
is this like a walking dead customer who never got started right and is just like not looking good? Or is this one of our most successful customers, one of our case studies that we should really double down on and spend a lot of time on? I think most folks, uh, you know, if I asked you to go get this data right now, <laughs> I think most folks could probably find, they know where to find an account name. It's perhaps in your CRM or something. You also can find who owns that account. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, in your, uh, it's in your CRM again, or it's in your customer success tool. You could find me the account, and you could probably find me who owns the account, right? I don't know how many people could actually give me a renewal date, and of those who could, how many it would be accurate. A lot of times, you know, the renewal date in your billing system might be different than the renewal date in your CRM, might be different than the renewal date in the spreadsheet from six months ago. Um, so I think, you know, when you think about renewal date, think about getting it from a real source of truth, like your billing system. Again, with, with MRR, I think uh, a lot of times you have MRR data floating around in various places. Um, once again, you want the real source of truth. There's nothing worse than going to a customer and saying, hey, your contract renews on May 18th for 400 MRR. And they say, no, 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 on my paper, it says May 24th for 314. That's not a good way to start the renewal. Getting accurate data from the system of truth is critical. And then lastly, on this uh, renewal likelihood, um, there's a lot of ways people kind of grade health and stuff. And I think health is a useful input to renewal likelihood. What we're really looking for here is some simple way to think about renewals. Um, is it red? Like this thing ain't renewing, no way, no how. Is it green? Like looking good, this one's gonna go through really well. Or is it somewhere in the middle uh, on the not so much side with orange or on the more yes than no side with yellow? I really like a four point system personally for your renewals, because there's no middle ground. There's no place to hide. If you have like a five point health scoring, you'll see like kind of a bell curve form. And most of your people managing renewals will stick most of their customers in the middle. It's just kind of human nature. I really like an even numbered system there, four points uh, when you just kind of score this renewal likelihood. So five pieces of data. As far as like you scoring it, like what do you yeah. think kind of goes into the, the mindset of the likelihood? Are you looking at, you know, is it, is it the CSM's kind of gut instinct on working that account? Is it usage? Is it, you know, survey feedback? Like what, are, there, are there any kind of data points that you're like, got to have those in there? Or yeah. kind of what, how do you think through that? I think through three categories of data, and I want a point of reference on each of the three. The better your point of reference and the more data in each of the three, the better. But at its core, there are three kind of angles I like to attack it from. Uh, one is like usage and value. So do we think that this customer through the usage of our product or solution has experienced value? Mm -hmm. There's a million ways to measure usage and all that stuff. And I don't want to get into it, but like one of them is usage. Okay. Two of them is engagement. So, you know, have they not shown up to every one of the QBRs you've tried to offer them? Have they never called your support team? Do they call your support team every day, right? Sort of the engagement with the human elements. So, so far we have the product and the human. And then third is commercial. So, you know, if you are on an annual contract with, and you're sending them quarterly invoices, do they pay their invoices? Or every time you do it, do they end up in an AR nightmare where, you know, it takes six months to wring the money out of them that they already owe you. If that's the case, you might have a hard time with the renewal. So I like usage, cool. uh, engagement, and commercial. And then I think, you know, the renewal likelihood to me is really something that uh, is an opportunity for leaders and individual contributors to partner on and to think like, you know, can we guess and check each other and kind of challenge each other? Is the usage actually good? Is the engagement actually good? And have a kind of a dialogue to come up with, are you red, orange, yellow, or green? Cool. cool. Great. So we think through those five pieces of data. Um, I'm a bit of a spreadsheet nerd. I think when you talk operations, many people are. So I hope this isn't where I'm going isn't terrifying. Uh, hopefully we're somewhat comfortable here. I know a lot of us are really comfortable with Google Sheets. So that's my tool of choice uh, for today's presentation at least. And you know, I've got my five pieces of data here. CSM name, the account name, right? We just talked about these five. And let's imagine I can actually manage to get those bits of data out of my billing system, out of my CRM, out of my customer success tool, whatever it is, right? Um, and they're accurate because they're from sources of truth. Frankly, doing this in a spreadsheet, if you don't have anything, is a pretty nice way to do it because you can have each column come from a different place. You can do the joins on the back end and try to make it um, you know, reasonably uh, accurate. So you get the data together and you probably have something that looks like this. All right, one, one, uh, one note here is that you'll see, um, as I kind of talk about this presentation, you know, we'll talk about renewal windows, like we're talking backwards 90 days and all this kind of time-based stuff. I think you want to basically, for the sake of organizing your data, basically want to dump as much data as you can to have as much visibility out into the future. So think about looking six months at least out. Uh, today happens to be May, so I'll be talking kind of through the end of 2020 for the sake of argument today. 
Cool. Then we also talked about the four um, kind of the four red, orange, yellow, green uh, projected uh, the, kind of the renewal prediction based off of all that data and the conversation that you have about each count. What you want to do is think about each one of those um, kind of health codes as having a projected renewal rate. If it's labeled red, it's probably not going to renew. Is it a 0% renewal rate on those? I don't know, maybe like 5%, right? Uh, be generous. On the green, it's probably not 100%. Some of those fall out. You're probably wrong on some of them. So we say 95% uh, likelihood if it's labeled green. And in the middle on orange and yellow, it's kind of a judgment call. It's something you learn more of over time is how likely those folks are to actually renew. For the sake of this presentation today, I'm saying, look, if it's labeled orange, it's a 20% renewal um, likelihood. And if it's labeled yellow, it's a 70%. Um, you may find in your business that, you know, if you use a four point scale, those numbers end up being a little bit different. These are kind of the ones that I'm using for the sake of example today. All right. So four point scale, and then this probability to close. Those are the two key pieces in here that I'm calling out on this slide. So when you think about kind of going through each one, having a conversation with the person that owns it, you want to have that four point scale. You mark each one with the kind of health code there, and then you have your probability of close. It's on the right column. Okay. So. If we start to work this through, I took the same spreadsheet, I added one more column. I call it probability adjusted MRR. For those of you who have ever worked in sales or especially in inside sales, um, this is gonna be a familiar concept. You basically take the amount of MRR, oops, uh, the amount of MRR that we have here for this one, account number one is 3,300 MRR. And we say, oh, this, we marked this one orange. Orange had a 20% likelihood to close, if you recall from our last uh, little table. So we take the 3,300 and we multiply it by 20% and we get a probability adjusted MRR. This column is really important, all right? It's an output of kind of, you know, the five before it. So it's not a piece of data from another system. It's, it's something you derive through the process. And it's really, really important because what this does is it, it will help us understand, as you'll see in a few minutes, it'll help us understand which months are gonna be really challenging for us in the future, renewal-wise, and which months might be easier. It'll also help us when we go into a kind of pipeline review meeting with our folks at own renewals, know where to focus and where the leverage might be. So coming up with this a probability adjusted MRR, which is again, just the MRR multiplied by the likelihood that we associate with each one of these color codes, actually a really important part of the process. And you'll see in a minute kind of how this operationalizes and flows through. But from a data perspective, I wanna just reinforce this. You don't need all the data in, a wor in the world to get visibility into your renewals and to start doing a good job at it. You need accurate data, yes, but you don't need all of the data. So if your data is like everybody else's and it's kind of a rat's nest, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. Start with these five pieces, then this one calculated bit uh, over here on the right, it'll get you really, really far as you see. Cool. So there's a couple of questions here. The, the, the first couple of questions kind of have to do with kind of that column C and it's more around like what, what happens if the, the actual MRR at this stage is different than what it was initially. So like there might be upsells, cross sells in there, like, you know, are you creating new opportunities for those? Like that, that, that's kind of one side of the question. And the other side of the question is just, yeah, just like what happens if like there's an uptick in that, how does that factor in, in your mind? Yeah. So there's two types of uh, changes, right. That you might experience in MRR. I I'm not going to, not going to dive into the opportunity part of your question because uh, that's cool. like its own webinar. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, opportunity management. We'll do that. There's two types know. of changes that you could have happen. So imagine you sign up a customer on day one, they pay you 3,000 MRR, and then on day 100, they upgrade and now they're paying you. They're like this one on the first row here. They're paying you 30, 3,300, 39 dollars, and now they're walking into the renewal with 3,300, 39 dollars of revenue, right? That's one type of MRR change. The other type of MRR change is a change that hasn't happened yet, but is contracted to happen at the renewal date, right? So perhaps, you know, they're, they're using more seats, but you agreed not to charge them until the renewal date, or they've, you know, they you said you sell like an email product and you've sent more emails and your, your, their bill is going to change then. Those are two pretty different types of MRR change. Um, what I have here, is really intended to be um, today's MRR, like what you actually have in AR, what you actually bill them. The deltas on top of that, I think are opportunities that perhaps are like, you know, another column to add here, like changes already booked or something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe you wanna add that in and understand that as a component of your renewals in order to kind of see where the opportunity is and see where the risk is. Because sometimes you have downgrades baked in there too. If somebody had canceled a bunch of seats, but that, actual MRR change isn't going to hit until the renewal. Cool. Hope that was a useful one. 
Yeah, that was a good one. And then I guess the, the, other, the other question I see kind of related to this is like column E, like for you, do you distinguish between likelihood to renew and health score? Or do you kind of feel those are an element of the same thing? Or is one an input to the other? Like, how, how do you think about yeah. that? To me, health is an input to renewal prediction. Um, they, they perhaps could be the same thing. I think most of us though, our health scores are kind of these passive measurements that ingest a bunch of data, but often don't have kind of the, you know, call it CSM spider sense, <laughs> you know, like sure. kind of just yeah, right. knowing that. And so what I like to do is, is treat the renewal uh, specially, right? So you have health, but then kind of have the renewal prediction that is really a thoughtful um, approach to each account that the CSM takes perhaps with their manager. Cool. Makes sense. Good. Cool. Let's keep rolling. Keep going. Uh, yeah. The pace will actually pick up here a bit despite uh, despite some of the uh, visuals. All right. So think about what we've talked about so far in the last 20 minutes. Step one is the whiteboard, defining your approach, working backwards from the renewal date, mapping out the bits and bobs that need to happen along the way. Step two is organizing your data. I've kind of got my five pieces, um, but I actually really like the suggestion about MRR changes. There might be a sixth one that you need in there, um, but it doesn't take a ton of data to get organized. You just need visibility out into the future. I like looking out six plus months or for the remainder of the year. Um, and then third, what we're about to talk about is the forecast that you can generate off of that data. We didn't have that much data in there on a per account basis, but we can do some really, really powerful things with this data. That's what I wanna talk about in this section. Okay, so remember those five pieces. Who's renewing, who owns it, when, how much, and real likelihood. The whole point of this is visibility. Recall back to my, uh, my, my good gift game with the rest of development stuff. There's a lot of people asking you, if you really own renewals, they're asking you like all sorts of things like, Oh, can you, you know, do this this month? Can you do that this month? Is retention going to be better or worse this month? Or this client uh, wants to do something differently, whatever. The answers to all of those questions start with visibility. So the whole point of this data is to produce visibility. And what I've got here is a spreadsheet that I've generated by just making some formulas on top of the data from before. So if you can, just try to not look at some of the numbers and get lost in there for a moment. Just come with me on the left side and the stuff that I'm circling. So there's some outputs of those data set, the data set that we showed, those five pieces of data that are super powerful to give you visibility into your renewal operations and your renewal pipeline. The first chunk here up top that I have circled is kind of just like the basics. How big is your business? What's your install base MRR? How many customers are actually in there for the sake of my little example spreadsheet? I've just got 200. Right? What is the renewal cohort MRR? So that adds up for a given month for May how much renewal money is actually up for June, how much is coming up, and then the renewal cohort in terms of account. Uh, so I have 14 accounts renewing in May for 33,000 MRR of my 43,000, uh, excuse me, 423,000 total. That's how to read this thing. As you read off to the right, you can see stuff like moves around a little bit, right? So, you know, I've got kind of a bigger month in May and a smaller month in December. Right? And that starts to actually inform and give us some visibility into the shape of this thing. And I think you guys can see where I'm going, that getting visibility into this kind of can tell you where to focus as a leader and where the leverage might be in terms of relationship and where the risk might be in terms of experience. If you, you know, have a ton of renewals running through one month, you might actually not have the number of people hours to service those. So we start with some kind of basic calculations here. Right? The second piece here down below, what I've, what I've done is I've woven in the health score. So I've said, look, of that 33,000, tell me how many is definite cancel or ready? How many is marked that way by a CSM? How many is a likely cancel? How many is a likely renew? And how many is a definite renew? So this section here, the eight, the seven, the 10, the five, sums to the 33, it's just kind of a breakout of that. But that's not already, a forecast, that's just the breakup of what's above. It's just the breakout of what's above. We can use it for forecasting, like I'll show in a second. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so that's just like, you know, what does the data tell us? about the renewals that we have coming up. And we can learn some stuff. We say, oh, that's kind of interesting actually, that our renewals in May have this big yellow contingent. So likely renewal, likely to renew, maybe some health issues, maybe some value issues, and actually very few greens. So maybe there's an interesting opportunity because we're working 90 days in advance of the renewal, we're approaching these way before, to like move some of those yellow to green. Or if I look out at, um, at uh, August, I can say, oof, this is a mess, <laughs> right? It's not that I have a lot of folks that are definitely gonna cancel, but I have a lot that are like pretty unhealthy and very few on the healthy side of the fence. And so again, 
we start to get the shape of the thing. We start to build some kind of like, you know, as creatures of revenue and process, we start to kind of build some, um, you know, uh, potential playbooks that we might run. Let's keep going down the spreadsheet. Down here is really the same things in terms of account. So if we look at, you know, August, well, it's not surprising perhaps we have a lot of uh, revenue in this orange bucket because we have nine customers there, right? But maybe it is surprising for May that we have a lot of revenue in the yellow thing because there's only four. That tells us that those accounts might be bigger or smaller. So breaking out your accounts by health, super important to just break apart this problem and start to figure out where to go at it. And then lastly, we can start to calculate some kind of like, I'll call this the cool stuff because this is like what I nerd out about because I like this sort of thing. Um, you know, we can, we can sum up the amount of at-risk MRR, right? So this is everything that's not green. So it's a sum of 10, 7, and 8. We can look at the projected cancellation MRR, which is uh, basically saying like, you know, I had I have $5,000, in green. I said I was going to do it 95%, right? And it basically cross multiplies the amount you have in each health bucket and it sums it up. And then we can net that out into a churn rate based off the 15,000 and the, four, and the 423,000 that we are as a business. And then down at the bottom, we can do the same in terms of gross customer churn rate. So you can begin to output some really interesting financial metrics. Remember, we only had to input five pieces of data in order to get this and kind of get the shape of the thing. This, pro this projected cancellation MRR is perhaps the most interesting thing. So I just want to make sure everybody's got it here. What this is, is it takes the percentages that we have over here, right? And it multiplies the amount of MRR up for renewal by those percentages. Remember we talked about the 3,300 and it's orange and orange is a 20% renewal likelihood. So we have 668 likely to get renewed. This is the same thing you do if you're on a sales pipeline with probability weighted uh, forecasting. Basically what we have here on the spreadsheet down at the bottom is the, the sum of all of those probability adjusted weights. So this tells us some really interesting things. And again, it's based off all the, the health scoring. So we can say, wow, these months here in May and, uh, excuse me, May and June, like those are not looking good. We're projected to churn 15,000 and 16,000. But after that, we actually go through a quieter period down to 12 and nine and 11. And then, whoa, October is gonna be a bear. And that's going to be the month that makes or breaks my Q4. So when you use the probability adjusted method of multiplying the amount of MRR by their likelihood to renew, you can develop some, again, really interesting viewpoints and start to drive some action into your pipelines and start to look for where the leverage is going to be as you actually go to do this work. And you get some really cool financial metrics, uh, which are fun if you're a nerd like me. If you're less of a nerd, but still kind of a nerd, you can visualize this stuff and you can make some charts out of it. So here are just some of the charts that I've um, visualized from the last slide. Uh, so here we have the um, uh, gross churn rate down at the bottom, right? And here I have mapped it month over month based off of our data set. And we can see, wow, like I said, uh, some months are going to be easier and some months are going to be harder. We're projecting based on the likelihood of those customers, a worse or better renewal. We can also start to look at renewal cohorts like this, one of my favorite ways. We can say, all right, how much is up for renewal? Here's the big October cohort. And then we can say, oh, of that, of that renewal cohort, how much is healthy, it's green, and how much is unhealthy? In my business example here, we have a lot of red because my data was just randomized, um, but you can kind of see again the shape of the thing and each month tells a different story. That story is really, really important as a leader to getting your arms around this stuff, creating predictability in your business, but also knowing where the leverage is. One more chart, it's the same one as the last one. So we've got this one that just counts up the dollars and this one that's just a kind of a stack bar chart. Again, helps you get the shape of the thing. So once you have your data organized and you can kind of see out into the future, you can start to visualize and get the shape of it and start to know where the leverage might be. So it turns out these five pieces of data are really, really useful, right? Like we can do a lot with it. I just spun you up a whole like basically renewal management uh, you know, process there. But if you add in more, there's even cooler stuff you can do. You can add in product or usage. Um, you can add in past payment history, support engagements, CSM engagements. The richer you can make your data set while keeping it very accurate, uh, the more you can slice, dice, and segment your renewals and do some really, really cool stuff. But just to get started, I'm a huge fan of these five because they give you so much attenuation and visibility into the process. This might make you think too of all the other kind of things you can, uh, you can get up to like, wow, I could look and segment just my renewals by, you know, product, 
by maybe a starter product or an enterprise product or something like that. I could segment them by geography and say, ooh, actually, for some reason, we have a bunch of renewals in Europe this, this month in Europe and not in America. You could also segment it by CSM and say, ooh, like Mike seems to have a lot of renewals, but Tala doesn't, right? And maybe I should be rebalancing my accounts in some way so I can actually get to this work. So a lot of this forecasting and a lot of this numbers work, I think, is important to just informing us and kind of driving thoughts of how we can reorganize our business to be more successful once we have the visibility and the accuracy. All right, let's talk about the last piece here, which is really bringing this stuff to life with your team that's doing renewals and with your customers. We actually haven't talked about customers yet. We've been working it backwards uh, from kind of operations into CSM and into customers. So let's talk about the kind of second to last piece of operationalizing your management of this stuff now that you have visibility. So. Let's say there's a month that we want to look at here, um, like July in my data. July is kind of an interesting month. It's not a huge month uh, nominally, right? It's about $28,000 of MRR I'm renewing, but it's got a lot of unhealthy customers. Like this is a pretty gnarly month actually, because almost everybody is coming up for renewal for one reason or another, they're not looking good. So let's dig in. We can kind of take July and double click on it. And if you're using Excel or Google Sheets, you can literally double click on it in a pivot table and it'll do it for you. <laughs> it'll give you an output like this. And I can look at July, all right? So here's July, this row here. And I can look across and say, oh, Jack has 8,900 of renewals. Mark has four, or 8,900. Yeah, 8, Mark has 14,000. Tala has 8,000. That's my total of 32,000. And actually, this is Mark's month. Wow. Like, other months, other people are kind of holding the bag, but it's really Mark that needs to execute this month. Otherwise, we're gonna be in trouble. And so as a manager, again, I'm getting the shape of the thing. I'm figuring out where to spend my time, my team's time in order to drive better results. I can talk with Mark and say, Mark, what's going on? And maybe Mark says, oh, you know, I got these five accounts renewing. And here's what they look like, because this is the same data that we use as an input to the model. We're just packing and unpacking it, zooming in, zooming out. And now here we're looking at kind of the grain of sand on the individual account level. And Mark's like, oh, geez, yeah, you know, it's a, really, it's a really bad month because I have my biggest customer, is 3,800, and they are just not looking good. They're gonna cancel. I, I said they're red. We all agree there's no, like, no chance for them. I, I'm gonna try though. I'm just gonna like give it one last shot. That's a pretty interesting statement that a lot of CSMs make to their manager or about how they manage their time. They're like, I got the big kahuna, I gotta go after it. In Mark's case here, that might not actually be the wisest thing. And we can see that because of the visibility into the pipeline. So for Mark, this is the big one. And then he's got this other one down here for two grand that's looking pretty good. But actually, the, like, kind of the fat part of Mark's month, that's going to make or break my month as, a, as the revenue leader for this business. The fat part is kind of up here. It's all this stuff in the middle. Like it's orange, it's yellow. It's like it's not dead, but it's not for sure. There's like a whole lot of revenue tied up in there. In Mark's case, almost half of his number is in that. It's about 8,000 MRR of his $14,000 renewal month. And it might be the best use of Mark's time and the business's time to actually go after that, as opposed to going after the biggest account, the biggest uh, renewal, which is only 3,800. So when you kind of look at it like this and you start to really dig in, again, zoom into the grain of sand and get really close to it, it tells you how to spend your time and find the leverage to move the revenue number that you're trying to manage. And I think a lot of us, we naturally gravitate to this, which is the biggest number, or to this, which is the healthiest accounts and want to spend the most time with us. But the most revenue leverage might actually be this, which is that like funky middle part. And you know what? This is a great time as a leader to really partner, get in the trenches with your team and help playbook and figure out what you're going to do. And remember, because we're working backwards from the renewal date and we're organized with our data and we're starting in advance, you've got your whole renewal window to manage this, 90 days, six months. So there's enough time to actually have a meeting, think slowly, don't just react, come up with a real plan, get with your customer, try to produce some value well before the renewal date. You want to get out ahead of this stuff so you can leverage uh, this kind of approach and really make change. Cool. So that's how I think about kind of operationalizing it. And you, you, you sort of begin to get into a place where your team and you start to learn the rules of the game. You start to realize, okay, like every month, I'm going to talk with my manager about my renewals that are a few months out. Every month, we're going to talk about forecasting based off of health. Every month, we're going to talk about where the leverage is and we're going to playbook. And you start to realize, oh, okay, there's an operating model as an individual contributor. Realize there's an operating model. And then people just naturally will start to optimize their behavior around the right stuff. 
one month Mark might come to you and be like, you know, I think I know what to do this month. I'm not going to focus on my biggest renewal. I'm not going to focus on my uh, happiest customers. I'm going to focus on the middle where there's a lot of leverage. And you know, then that's a great moment as a leader where you can say, wow, Mark, you really got it. Let's play book that together. Let's figure out what you need to be successful for that renewal cohort in July. All right, one more little piece here. Um, this is a pretty short, a short section. Um, it just kind of, if you think about what we've gone through here, right? We got organized on the whiteboard. We created visibility via data, not much data, a small amount of accurate data is what we need. We created focus. We, we could see the shape of our uh, renewal pipeline and where to focus. We could then collaborate with our team to create outcomes. That's what this is all about. It starts with organization and ends in outcomes. With all this focus though, like that's how we drive revenue. And you kind of saw it in my example of how I would coach Mark about his five renewals coming up in July. And we can start to use some tools that as managers, um, people managers, and you know, just folks that have worked perhaps in revenue, recurring revenue businesses are more uh, familiar. The forecast update where we say, Mark, how are you looking? How's the forecast for this? Has this changed at all? The pipeline review, where as a manager, I run down and say, here are your five accounts. How are we doing? Customer segmentation, where I can look at my accounts by geography, by uh, product line, whatever it is. I can start to leverage situational playbooks. Oh, here's a customer with a big account whose implementation went well, but now has an orange renewal likelihood. There's a playbook for that. You can start to get organized and operationalized and repeatable around it. You can start to do film and call reviews because Mark has two of these accounts that are kind of yellow and coming up on renewal and so does Tala. And you can listen to those calls together and understand and train and drill on what works and what doesn't. You can leverage your executive team and other people at the business and pull them in. If it's a really big account and you're six months in advance and part of the game plan is leverage the CEO's relationship with their CEO, it's a great time to call on executive escalation. And then lastly, everything I've really talked about so far is human powered. It's kind of Fred Flintstone. Uh, remember, it was, it's, it's renewal management for dummies. We're not trying to get into like the AI super sophisticated stuff. But once you know what you're doing, you have the visibility and you can focus, then you start to see patterns and you start to have some repeatability around those playbooks. You can start to automate and enable a lot more self-service for your customers, which can make their experience really, really good along the way too. All right. So guys, that's kind of the, that's the breakdown of this thing. We started off with like five simple, uh, five simple verbs here, define, organize, forecast operationally, and then drive. We have five pieces of data. I guess it's a five, five, five kind of day. Um, and hopefully this kind of gave you a little bit of a view into um, how I've seen companies level up their renewal management because often you're doing it, but it's kind of like complicated and you need to take a step back. How I've seen startups begin to do it when they realize renewals is going to be an important part of their operation. Um, or even for really big businesses who are trying to re-examine and get back to fundamentals in this time around um, you know, their renewals and their revenue. Uh, just a kind of straightforward common sense approach that involves not too much data, even not too many tools. It's really just um, Excel, although there's lots of ways to level it up. Just to help you kind of get a hold of this, to help you get visibility, partner better with your CFO, with perhaps your manager, if they're a CRO or your CEO. Um, and then actually do better through customer experience to operationalize better revenue outcomes. So that's it guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, I really hope you all stay safe out there nowadays. Um, if you want to talk, I always would be happy to. Uh, I love this stuff because I am a nerd. If you made it this far in the webinar, so are you. I'd like to talk with you. <laughs> uh, hit me up. It's Mike at SaaSworks or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd love to continue the conversation. Cool, man. This has been great. We got a bunch of questions. Maybe we got a few more, few minutes we can kind of chat through some of the questions, but really appreciate you taking the time here. And one of the things I'll just kind of put in a plug for is like, you've, you've done a really cool job of laying out like the, the, the specific aspects of, you know, what an operation could look like. And I'll just even put in a plug for client success here. There's a lot of this stuff that like, if you're looking for a software that can actually enable you to do this, to go beyond just the spreadsheet, if you're kind of to that point, um, let me know, give, give me a shout at client success. Um, and I'll have one of my team kind of walk you through kind of what we've built around this. Cause there's a lot that, you know, you can, we, we've built around that, but, um, yeah. So let me, let, let me jump into a couple of the questions here. So, um, we got a couple minutes and some of the questions are like super tactical to like an individual business. So I might not get to, to those, but maybe one of the questions that I'll jump into and we'll get through as many as we can is related to like, how do you staff this? So, you know, in some companies, like you, you, in this example, you've talked through, okay, we're going to have a CSM on it, but there's some companies that have sales on it. Um, I know on the team that you built at HubSpot, you actually ended up bringing in a, sp a specialized, you know, a renewals management team. Like what are some of the, 
there's, there's probably not a, a black and white right and wrong always answer, but like, what are some of the implications that you think through and maybe like, what are the situations where you'd have a CSM on it versus a renewals team on it versus yeah. a sales team on it? How do you think about that? I remember just laughing. You guys can see my face here. Like, uh, cause this is as fraught with opinions as like, you know, should CS roll up to whomever? How should sure. I, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So th this is one, this is one of those questions. Um, I think there are some rule of thumbs. Uh, I'm one person. I have one set of experience. So take this with the old grain of salt. But, um, I think if you have a, uh, a kind of, uh, a, a relationship with your customers that is, and maybe you don't call them customers, you call them clients, like, you know, you're, you're, you're working in solutions and like long-term contracts and you, know, you have account executives, not salespeople, and you're that type of business that's really relationship driven. I think often the renewal um, and handling that uh, from a negotiation standpoint should really rest with the person that originally got the deal with the account executive. And that's a, that's a world in which, you know, you kind of, um, you eat what you kill and, you know, you, you go for, you have, you have somebody on the sales side that's hunting and farming and account, an account executive kind of thing. Often there's people that help them out and, you know, maybe help with dealing with procurement, help with dealing with legal, but really the ownership rests with them and they're supported. Uh, that's in a, like a really high ACV kind of high touch environment. Um, in the middle, you have a business uh, like what Mark mentioned at HubSpot, um, where you know we had uh, relatively kind of high ratios. You're managing a bunch of uh, a bunch of accounts as a CSM, and I think when you're kind of smallish, it can make a lot of sense to have your CSMs do this work because the proof's in the pudding, and they need to get comfortable with actually negotiating you know these renewals, and um, you just don't have the headcount to add in a whole team. Um, but once you get big, you know you got 50 plus, you know, CSMs, it can make sense to specialize it and maybe carve off 10% of the team to handle this um, from a negotiation standpoint. The challenge in that model is, you know, there's this renewal timeline, 90 days, six months, whatever it is. And there's a, there's a weird weaving in and out of like customer value, customer radiation with like negotiation, finance and procurement and legal. And so in a perfect world, you put all the finance, procurement, legal stuff and kind of hardcore negotiation in a specialized person. And then you kind of keep all the value stuff over here in a CSM. It's, it's not going to work out like that, right? It's going to be a little feathered in and identifying the places where you have overlap is really tricky. And so I think don't break off and specialize this unless you're prepared to handle the operational overhead of figuring out the swim lanes and kind of how those teams feather in. For other, uh, for other organizations, if you're like really low ACV, um, you, you may kind of just have the renewals roll through. You might have auto renew clauses in your contract and they just kind of happen. Like I don't talk to anybody at Netflix when I renew their subscription business. Um, and you know, maybe then you have some people that opportunistically take a look at their pipelines and perhaps do some like outbound customer success to say like, Hey, you know, you've got this renewal coming up. I wanted to talk with you about it. Make sure you're good just to ensure that those renewals are going through smoothly and make sure that you're not leaving any money on the table. So it improves the experience and it can improve the revenue outcome. So it's really a spectrum. Uh, those are the three ways that I think you kind of break up the spectrum. Cool. Well, this is awesome. We're, we're right at the top of the hour. So maybe what we'll do, there's a ton of questions in the Q and a, maybe since we're at the top of the hour, maybe what Mike and I will do is we'll, we'll hop on and maybe do a, do a follow up to this kind of answer all the questions in the Q and a. So if you have any questions that we haven't gotten to, and there's a bunch of them, um, feel free to continue to put them in the chat pane. I'll, I'll, I'll keep this open for a little while so you can pop them in there. Um, or you can just email them to either Mike or me. I'm, you know, mark.stoddard at clientsuccess.com, or you can email Mike at mike at sassworks.com. But any last words that you want to share with everybody, Mike? Um, well, I mean, the slide says it. Uh, I hope everybody's doing all right. Um, you know, in, in terms of Dave's, um, you know, kind of call to action to be helpful, uh, here, here's mine to all of you. You know, if you did, if you were one of those folks who put a really tactical question in there, um, I'm happy to talk. Uh, I want to help. That's like, that's part of how I think I can help is just to, you know, sit down for a half hour and talk that stuff through. So there's no question too simple. Uh, like I said, at the beginning of this, we are all trying to figure out, you know, how to do renewals and how to just do life uh, nowadays together. So hit me up, send me an email, send me a LinkedIn message. I am on Twitter too. I just didn't put it here. Um, and I would, I would love to help you run a better business um, and get through this better. Cool. Well, this has been great. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and yeah, we'll, well, one last thing I'll say. So we're going to continue this series going. Um, next week, we're actually going to do something a little bit different. We have a Tuesday, Thursday slot also built. But actually, what we're going to do on Tuesday is we have David Jackson, who's based in the UK. And so what we're gonna actually going to do is we're going to do this a little bit earlier in the day. We're going to do it at a more UK-friendly time zone. So I think it'll be 4.30 UK time. 
um, which would be, I think, 11.30 in the morning on the East Coast. I'll send out more details on that. But, you know, thanks again to Mike and really looking forward to seeing everybody on, on future sessions. So we'll call it a day. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks so much, Dave. Bye, everybody. All right. See you, everybody.